Now we're going to go to the original topic of this video. How to convert a SuperHet SSB receiver or SSB transceiver from one band to another. Let's first of all draw a block diagram of a SuperHet receiver. Here's the mixer, the local oscillator, there might be an IF amplifier, a filter, another amplifier, a product detector, another oscillator, probably a BFO, and an audio amplifier. There's your speaker at the end. Tuning 14 to 14.4. IF is at 10 megahertz. 14 megahertz signals are coming in, being mixed with 4 megahertz. Our output here is at 10 megahertz, which is the IF. Beating against the BFO at 10 megahertz, the difference is at audio frequency, and so we can hear the signal quite plainly. And because the filter's there, there's good selectivity also. Let's say we wanted to convert this receiver to 7 MHz. We can't be bothered in changing all the IF and detector circuits, so we'll leave that and the filter well alone. Our desired incoming frequency range is 40 meters or 7 to 7.3 MHz. We still need a difference of 10 MHz, so we can again have the local oscillator above or below. In this case, we'll go for below because there are some interesting effects that we'll talk about in a minute. The difference between 10 and 7 megahertz is 3 megahertz. So if you had your local oscillator on 3 megahertz, mixing with your incoming signal on 7, one of the outputs from here is 10 megahertz, which is fine for the crystal filter. Now, if the incoming signal was 7.3 MHz, then the local oscillator needs to be 10 minus 7.3, which is actually 2.7 MHz. I've written it in reverse order there. In other words, as you tune up from 7 to 7.3 MHz, you're actually tuning down on your local oscillator from 3 to 2.7 megahertz to maintain your 10 megahertz difference. If you're following all that carefully, you'll notice that the IF was actually below the incoming signal when we had it on 14 megahertz, but then when we converted it to 7 megahertz, the IF was above the incoming signal. That's not all that important. Even if you've got the relationship right between your incoming signal the local oscillator and the IF, and you've arranged the bandpass filter at the front end to be on the incoming signals frequency, that's not all you have to think about. Amateurs generally use upper sideband above 10 MHz and lower sideband below 10 MHz. That's what we'll talk about next. The sideband that your receiver will receive depends on the frequency relationship between your BFO crystal, which is also 10 MHz, and the bandpass of your crystal filter, also approximately 10 MHz. If the, the signal from the BFO below your crystal filter's bandpass, then it will permit upper sideband signals through. On the other hand, if it's above, a little bit above the bandpass of the crystal filter, then that's a lower sideband signal. So if you did want to receive both upper and lower sideband with this receiver, then you need to slightly vary the frequency of that BFO. Um, you might need to change it from say 9.997 below the bandpass of the filter if you are receiving upper sideband signals or Conversely, if you want to flip it over for lower sideband reception, then you might actually want it to be on 10 megahertz. Normally, that's fairly easy to do with these sorts of crystals. You can have a VXO circuit, you can have a very low value of capacitor in series with the crystal that will increase the frequency of the crystal. 
possibly even a kilohertz or so above the marked frequency or you can instead put a coil in series and increase the value of the capacitor and make it variable and that will get you to a lower frequency. If you didn't want to be switching VXO circuits and it's not wise to do so because you've got the stray capacitance that switches might introduce is just to have two lots of RF oscillator circuits. Uh, you might need to buy two crystals for that but crystals are fairly cheap at least at standard frequencies so that isn't too much of a problem and you might have the outputs of both oscillators connected here but you might actually apply power to one of them power to this one depending on whether you want to receive lower or upper sideband signals. Sometimes you might come across a design that has an intermediate frequency of 10 megahertz, but you don't want it. You've got a limited selection of crystals that are cheaply available, so you might want to design specifically for those available frequencies. Many QRP rigs have an IF of 4.915 megahertz, and for our local oscillator, 4.915, let's say we have 12 megahertz, we'll make it a VXO. Well, the good thing about the difference between 12 megahertz and 4.915 megahertz, it's actually in the amateur band. It's around 7.085 megahertz. So that's an example of where two commonly available crystals, often cheaply available, just because of the coincidental difference between their frequency, can produce a useful frequency for amateur band reception. Another case, a common crystal frequency here is 8.867 megahertz. If you've got a VXO on 16 megahertz, then your difference between them is about 7.133 megahertz. And supposing you were to drop that down in a VXO to 15.9 megahertz, then that goes down to 7.033. Um, so you've got a 100 kilohertz slice of 40 meters that you could potentially cover. So that's one reason why you may change the frequency of an IF to suit crystals you have already, or you can commonly buy, or so that their sums and differences match up with other crystals and you can get some amateur band coverage. And although I've only covered receivers just here, it also applies equally to SSB transmitters and also CW rigs. In fact, CW is a little bit easier because you don't need to worry about considerations with the crystal filter here on transmit. There's some combinations that are bad and should be avoided. In this case, we have a high receive frequency and a low intermediate frequency. That's very prone to spurious signals if a transmitter and spurious responses if a receiver. It's doubly bad in this example because the image band is 27 MHz CB, so you're likely to be getting breakthrough from CB stations as you tune across 28 MHz. Here's another bad combination, in this case a 30 meter CW transmitter. The diagram shows two oscillators at 5.068 MHz being mixed together to produce a signal that's the sum of it, which happens to be in the 30 meter amateur band. There are problems in this arrangement, especially if you're not filtering the oscillator outputs. You'd be better off to instead have the 10 MHz frequency as the difference between these two oscillators. For instance, you might choose one where one oscillator is 16 MHz and another oscillator is 6 MHz. The harmonics of 6 MHz, i.e. 12, 18, 24 and so forth, are some distance from 16 megahertz, so you should be able to build some decent filtering. It's a problem when harmonics of different crystals are not that far removed in frequency, as that makes filtering extremely difficult. In a receiver, that results in spurious responses being picked up. In a transmitter, it results in a dirty output that's hard to filter. Now we're back to our 10 megahertz IF because of those cheap computer crystals we could get. Again, the BFO is 10 megahertz. 
and our local oscillator might be say 2 to 8 megahertz. We subtract those values from 10 megahertz and we have 2 to 8 megahertz. But the tuning will actually be in reverse. So when your local oscillator is on 2 megahertz, your incoming signal will be 8 megahertz. And when your local oscillator is up to 8 megahertz, then you'll be receiving signals down in the 2 megahertz range. Anyway, that's not really the problem. Supposing our local oscillator happens to be on 2.5 megahertz. Now, we have a part of the receiver that is potentially responsive to that, especially if you haven't suppressed the harmonics of that local oscillator. And that is our detector stage here. It's operating at 10 megahertz, and 2.5 times 4 is 10 megahertz. So if you were to tune across the local oscillator on here, you'll hear a birdie signal. But that won't be the only one. For instance, if you're around 3.3 megahertz, then, or 3.33, then that times 3 is again 10. And again at 5 megahertz. Again, 5 times 2 is 10. So on at least three spots of the dial, you will have these spurious responses generated within the receiver itself. I don't want to be too logical, but why do you have birds in your radio shaft? Well, every electronic engineer knows that a spurious emission from any piece of electronic equipment is called a birdie. If you're tuning on a shortwave radio and you hear a <whistles> go through, that's a birdie. How does it go? <whistles> oh, right. Or it could go, <whistles> or it might go. <whistles> Who knows? That just underlies the point that it's important to select the frequencies right, otherwise you might have some difficulties with spurious signals. It's particularly a risk if you have your local oscillator at a frequency lower than your IF. Also, if it's covering a wide tuning range, for instance if you're attempting a general coverage receiver. I don't want to put you off, but these are some of the things that can challenge anyone who tries to convert a transceiver design from one frequency to another.